welcome to um, welcome to the panel, Deep In and AI, Match Made in Heaven. Um, we've got some terrific panelists here, so I think we'll start this off kind of the regular way by just people introducing themselves and their projects, and then we can kind of get a little bit deeper pretty quickly. So first, um, you got the mic, Jan, you want to go first? Yeah, um, I'm Jan from Filecoin Foundation, so we are uh, decentralized storage solutions uh, solution, and uh, uh, yeah, that's, we're hoping that more AI projects can be built on top of our layer. Uh, and right now, I'm doing some technical integrations for AI projects in general. So, if there's any projects uh, and you want like a decentralized uh, network, please come to me. Hello, uh, my name's Mark. I'm the CEO and co founder of Aether. We build decentralized enterprise grade GPU cloud infrastructure. You can think of us uh, like a, an enterprise facing uh, GPU cloud marketplace. Uh, we allow kind of uh, enterprises data centers, crypto miners to contribute their GPUs uh, in a way that uh, allows them to be rewarded uh, through our network for, for work that they contribute. Uh, and then on the other side of the marketplace, uh, enterprise buyers can come, purchase, uh, compute from us in, in kind of a uh, high accessibility, uh, low cost format. Hi, my name is Daniel. I'm the CEO of Syntropy. Um, we um, publish Web3 data decentrally uh, and stream that in ultra-low latency, uh, any chain, anywhere, to apps and AI machine learning protocols that need it. Hey everyone, I'm Ben. Uh, I'm the co-founder of Jensen. We're a decentralized machine learning compute protocol. Um, so we connect up all of the machine learning capable compute hardware in the world, uh, GPUs, TPUs, CPUs, anything like that, uh, and provide it as a resource to anyone who wants to train machine learning models. Um, Jensen's a kind of long-running uh, research uh, company. We are building things to verify that the compute was done correctly. Um, we believe that the future of machine learning is very, very automated. So most of the, um, the entities triggering the training of machine learning models will be models themselves. Uh, and for that to be the case, we need verification built in. So you can't just trust that the person that has the compute has actually done the task. You need to know that it was done correctly. Uh, and that comes down to cryptographic proofs, game theoretic incentive mechanisms and probabilistic checks to ensure that programmatically you can check that the work was done. You don't need to trust a human at any point, essentially. Great. So I think to summarize, we've got storing, um, operating, connecting, and um, training, right? So there, that's, that's, that's the one sentence summary here. We can all go home now. Um, but I, what I, what I want to get a little bit deeper here and think about what the challenges are. And so you just, you know, Ben just talked about some of the challenges with regard to this, like, which is verification, validation, right? So that's a huge challenge. Um, I guess let's get into on the other, start, start back on this side or whoever wants to take it, challenges on your side with regard specifically to implementing your, your area with AI, right? So Filecoin storage, you know, how does that integrate with AI and what are the challenges there and what make you guys kind of specifically suited to meet those challenges? I, I think from a machine learning perspective, uh, from the machine learning uh, life cycle, for feature training, uh, we can ensure that the features used to train a model uh, has not been tampered with or even the model versioning of the AI models can be archived onto Filecoin to ensure that there is a proof of space time. So um, it... The data there will, will it will be immutable and it's ensured that nothing has been changed there at all. So this is something that we can contribute to the AI ecosystem. Uh, the next thing is uh, generally a lot of logs, <laughs> a lot of audits happen uh, needs needs to happen and to trace it back to where um, the training uh, it has to be traced back to where the training occurs to ensure that you know um, no, no one has tampered with the model or the decisions made are uh, uh, sound. Yep. So proofs of um, the proof the data is um, hasn't been corrupted, hasn't been altered, hasn't been changed. Yep, and I think it's going to be really important in the um, in the audit in future, so that people can trust AI more. Definitely. Yeah. So I think it, at Aether, we're on the infrastructure side, right? And when you look at Deepins, uh, traditionally we've been very good at kind of aggregating consumer hardware, right? Consumer GPUs and, and equipment that's contributed by, by our network. The issue with this type of infrastructure is it's, it's quite difficult to kind of package that infrastructure and then sell it in any meaningful way to, to large enterprises, right? There's kind of pretty strict service and uptime and quality requirements at these 
compute buyers have that are really difficult to kind of meet when you're trying to package up this uh, really kind of distributed diverse compute that comes from kind of a number of different uh, kind of, I guess, lower end uh, compute providers. At Aether, we kind of took uh, a very different approach to how we built our deep end network, focusing kind of exclusively on onboarding uh, really enterprise first, enterprise focused uh, GPU infrastructure, right? That contributed by uh, data centers or large enterprises. And we've very much kind of streamlined the type of infrastructure that's committed to our network in such a way that we can kind of really attack and meet the requirements of, of these big compute buyers in a way that uh, I guess traditionally deep end projects have, have struggled with. I think uh, what that kind of allows us to do is kind of challenge this uh, concept of, I guess, instability that exists within, within Web3, particularly around deep end networks, um, such that uh, we can kind of hopefully start to build that trust and encourage these large compute buyers to, to kind of look at deep end infrastructure as a viable place for kind of long term compute contracts. You know, that, that's a fascinating point because the, 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 you, you, you've hit on a, on a critical kind of issue here where Deepin is about crowdsourcing infrastructure, but that doesn't have to be individual retail infrastructure. Some of the biggest projects, it is, right? Helium 100% is, right? Um, HiveMapper for sure is. But when we're talking about institutional use cases, that, that kind of um, perception inhibits the deployment of this deep in infrastructure, even though it just as easily can be coming from institutional grade um, infrastructure, which is put together on this type of network. And so that's something obviously we're doing at Fluence. Filecoin's a great example, where Filecoin, you can have individual miners, but who's really dominating that network are professional miners that have run and built data centers at scale. And so that's what we're, we've seen happen, and I think that perception issue is something that we certainly need to overcome. I know we've had to deal with it um, at Fluence, where people think, where we mentioned peer-to-peer -peer network, and people are like, oh, that's not gonna work, no one's gonna use that, that's not reliable. Like, hold on a second, we're using the same data centers that you know, Netflix is using. Like, this is not all happening in someone's house. So I totally grasp that. On Daniel's side, um, love to hear your perspective on this, because you are, you're sort of institutional from kind of the beginning, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. So I, I guess from from our perspective at Centropy, it's it's kind of hard to underestimate how big the data challenge really is. Um, as soon as you start going into something cross chain, um, so running a Solana node is 110 terabytes. You know, add that Ethereum another 17, you're 150 terabytes, and you need to start to train your models on on this kind of data mass. Um, and so what we work on is like so you know data in blockchain is by by its nature open. Uh, and can be read by uh, block explorers. But if you need to then look over multiple chains and you need to be able to see the immediacy of the data sort of in the 30 to 50 millisecond range, right? Because these chains are trading wrapped assets that all represent each other. Um, then that's where Syntropy comes in, right? And you need to be able to get that data after you've trained your AI model sort of, um, you know, from the Genesis block, you need to be able to then work on the immediacy and act on that data um, uh, cross chain. Um, and, and in short of running all those nodes uh, yourself or indexing yourself, you have to trust somebody. Uh, and that's where we come in. We're the trustless, low latency variant of streaming data. Gotcha. Well, Ben, question for you. You can have a deep in network that runs centralized applications, right? And in fact, we expect to see that very often. Can you talk about um, decentralized? AI and decentralized networks where it's, you know, where you actually get the, that, that sort of, I think, where, uh, you know, I sort of love to see things go, but particularly where you are, um, love to hear your perspective on it. Yeah, I think we've, um, in the machine learning space, we've seen a progression of um, greater sizes of centralized models, and that's been really exciting. You've seen like ChatGPT, GPT-3, 4, et cetera, like really impressive models. But to us, they're the sort of tip of the spear. They're the, the research that shows what's possible with machine learning. The wave that comes after is how we actually productionize those models. We get them in the hands of loads and loads of people, and we get developers able to build their own versions of those models. And I think what we see, if, if we continue to build them in the way they're currently built, there's a, just a huge squeeze on the kind of number of people 
who can do that. They're built in this hyper-centralized way. It requires huge amounts of highly centralized infrastructure. But then you look at the entire world and you look at how much compute we actually have, we have huge amounts that we're just not using. And I think the machine learning space, I've said this a few times, but the machine learning space has quite a short memory. A lot of people assume that the way that we build models now is the only way to build really performant, like next level models, but it's not. It's just the first way that was effective. Um, and what decentralization is showing us now is you can actually go from maybe 4,000 GPUs in a data center that are all hyper-connected to millions of GPUs if you just change the way that you build the model. Uh, and there's some really exciting ways of building models in a decentralized way where actually, instead of being this kind of like singular brain that we've built in a single data center, it's this huge, rich ecosystem of kind of shards of model value that can be connected up. And I think that's what's really exciting within AI and machine learning because there's no kind of ceiling on top of that. Whereas now we're starting to see that ceiling where we just can't build bigger data centers. The cloud giants um, and the tech giants are actually, they're not constrained by money. They can buy GPUs, they can buy TPUs, they can put them in data centers, but they can't physically get data centers because we're running out of geographical places that can host data centers with enough GPUs in them. Actually, if you kind of take the Bitcoin approach and look at the entire world and say, well, if we just created a market over this and incentivize the people who have that location, who have the electricity, et cetera, to provide the compute, then you can build a much better system, a much richer system than the current one where the cloud giants have to go and fight for specific locations of data centers. Let's let the people who know how to build data centers do that and then give everybody else access to, those, uh, to that hardware, essentially. So yeah, I think decentralized models are the, the future, and I think it's going to be pretty exciting when we actually see the first real massive model exist. And, and you know, just could you summarize that a little bit? Do you think the challenge to decentralize a model, the first or scale decentralized model, is it, is it hardware access? Is it, you know, human expertise? Is it team size? Like, is it, is it a combination of those things? Which is the gating item now, do you think? That's a good question. I think we're, we're sort of flipping back and forth between the expert knowledge to, to build those models and the access to like decentralized hardware. So can I access a million MacBooks to train a model right now? Well, kind of not. Could I design a model that could do that? Probably, but I wouldn't really be able to test it until that infrastructure existed. So there's sort of a, a chicken and egg where those two things need to progress. And I think we're, we've seen the start of the expert knowledge progressing. There's some really good um, research papers that show within open collaborations. So just people volunteering hardware, we can actually build state-of-the-art models over these infrastructures. But that only scales up to maybe a 1,000 um, GPUs, where there's being a 1,000 kind of given voluntarily. We want to see what happens when you create a real game theoretic ecosystem over that where people are actually being paid. And then there's an incentive for people to provide those MacBooks and we can get millions of them. Long term, we can get I every iPhone on, on a network like this. The problem is if you introduce those economic incentives, then you introduce the incentive to cheat and not do the work properly. It's very, very hard to verify that when you're talking about a tiny shard of a decentralized model. You can't just say, well, the user will be able to tell because they won't. You have to have some kind of proof system in that before you can build a model like this. And I, I said large models before, I actually, I, I don't necessarily think large models are the future. I think it's going to be lots of kind of small pieces of model all being connected up where they need to be. So maybe you run a path through a large model. Maybe you only actually use a tiny bit of those models. Um, it'll be very use case dependent. So super specific models with specific data sets for specific kind of functions or expertise. I could, I could definitely see that. But what's, what's the, the, the analogy I was using previously was Windows had a massive head start, unlimited budget, and Linux was able to beat it. But Linux, the, the gating item there was just developer resources. It was not hardware specific. And the difference here is we have a hardware component as well. I guess with regard to that on, on Filecoin, could you talk about hardware, right? Because you guys have, are the experts in incentivizing hardware kind of investment by people, right? And so, you know, maybe mention the scale that the Filecoin network's grown to, the scale there, because that kind of provides a path for hardware um, deployment. Uh, yeah, sure. Um, I can't recall what's the exact exabyte of uh, data we are, we are storing now, but I think it's around 9.7 exabyte of data, and it's, uh, it's still expanding. Um, I think Ben spoke about two different things, which is the partition model, something that's very specific to each region uh, on specific data sets, and I think the Falcon ecosystem can also provide that. Um, other than the infrastructure side, there's a data side of things. Uh, data can't move out of regions because of uh, specific um, data protection laws. So generally, now what's happening is that people send the model to where the data resides and train the model there. 
Um, it's not that performant yet, but uh, I think in the next year or so, we can see like um, it improving. Uh, it's called federated learning, and it's going to be um, something that's quite big in the space as well, uh, something that decentralized or Web3 can incentivize to, to build this kind of machine learning uh, models as well. Uh, and I think Filecoin's data storage providers have a great head start in, in, in uh, this economy as well. So, and Mark, do you want to talk about that a little bit? Obviously, you're in the infrastructure side as well, so you want to see as much um, uh, capacity joining the networks overall. And, and one other question, who do you see using your capacity you're, joining, you're adding as well? Yeah, I think there's, there's two different types of, I guess, capacity, right? There's a capacity that maybe is facing the, the training side of the market, and there's a capacity that might be facing kind of inferencing side of the market. And I think what's quite interesting about deep in networks, and maybe something that I can talk to that's maybe a little bit different to, to what you guys might be discussing, is, is how decentralized networks uh, provide this really interesting um, use case for uh, ultra-low latency networks, right? So when you look at, at AI inferencing, latency is kind of a, a pretty important uh, concern. Uh, but when you look at how GPU networks scale, um, certainly in a traditional sense, you generally have you know, a large amount of equipment deployed in a single location, and essentially the further away a user is from, from that compute, the, 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 the more uh, degradation you see in the performance of, of that compute, right? So the further away you are from where the compute's happening, the more latency that user is experiencing. And in centralized solutions, all of the unit economics and the economies of scale of how that infrastructure scales kind of encourages people to put that equipment in one location, right? Uh, Google, if they're expanding into a new region, will put all of their hardware in, in a kind of one data center, right? Because it's the most cost-effective way for them to manage that equipment, right? But when you start to look at decentralized networks, you're kind of removing the incentive for hardware to clump, right? You're creating this ecosystem where there's really no uh, independent or, or, or overarching motivation for all this hardware to exist under the same roof. So as the network kind of grows in size, instead of kind of this one blob in the center of the dartboard kind of uh, just getting slightly bigger, you actually have a larger number of smaller nodes kind of appearing over, over the map, which uh, from a network perspective allows your network to start prioritizing kind of this local compute delivery, which is uh, generally kind of uh, higher performance and lower latency, which is kind of really interesting for, for the inferencing side. Uh, of the AI market. So I think from a hardware perspective, there's you know, a lot going on in the training side, but DeepIn also has this kind of really interesting angle on, on the inferencing side that I think is uh, equally interesting. Are those small kind of elements you mentioned, are those like smaller data centers? What, how do you, what are those in you know, physical terms? I think it's a combination of both, right? It's uh, distribution of equipment through data centers, distribution of equipment that's contributed by uh, enterprise players, but eventually uh, definitely inferencing, that, inferencing that's happening on equipment that's more contributed by consumers as well. And so do you see then, you know, you talked about the network being relevant for or customers wanting the performance of institutional capacities. Do you see yourself and you see the market moving beyond that into more into into retail as well with um, perhaps more um, you know software layer on top of it to ensure resilience or how do you how do you see that moving I think the the benefit of deep in networks is this ability to kind of have these unique ways to incorporate um, consumers right we don't necessarily need to just rely on the equipment that consumers have, right? Uh, we can encourage them to purchase certain types of equipment that help us kind of unify and reduce variability on, on the edge. Uh, and I think that's something that on the inferencing side will, um, will kind of address a lot of this variability and, and um, current difficulty that we have uh, meeting a lot of these enterprise compute requirements, specifically as it relates to, to kind of uh, consumer hardware and, and, and equipment that exists on that kind of bleeding edge of, uh, of the network. Gotcha. Um, so I guess one other thing is, what, what does it take, I guess, for each one of your businesses, do you think, to scale? Is it capital? Is it um, team? Is it um, access to something else? And I'll st start, with, start, with, start with Dan. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, uh, you know, in, when it comes to data, I think probably the, the easiest way to explain it is to, like, one of... One of the companies that we didn't think we were going to be working with that, that, that reached out to us was a company working on uh, autonomous economic agents. And I think that if you, if you start to, and, and these, are, these are sort of, these are agents that have one job, but they do this one job really, really well. 
but they have to, and they have a wallet, and they can, they can act on that impulse, and then they can execute, right? So what they need to rely on 100% is that the information that they're getting is accurate, and it has to happen in a time frame that they can act on it. And so um, we, didn't, like, we didn't go hunting for these guys uh, because, um, you know, but, but they came to us. Uh, and I think so for us, that's, that's a great example of, like, if you started thinking about, um, like if you were born today, you landed from Mars, you looked at the way that blockchain has evolved and what you have right now, you would be building on completely different architecture, right? You would be building on, immediately you would be multi-chain, immediately you would be decentralized, immediately you would be relying on a lot of the deep in infrastructure that's out there. And so for us, you know, it's, there's two ways, right? We can convert the initiated um, that, had, you know, that sort of grew up on these islands uh, with each with their own religion and, and, and their own faith or we can focus on um, the net new conversion, you know, the next one million wallets connected. And like from, from our perspective, it's much, much easier to kind of go down that route of the next one million builders. Um, and, and that's really where we're focusing a lot of our attention. So I think that it's, it's getting in, you know, getting, getting the inception into the brains of the next, you know, the next one million builders is, is really where we're, where we're heading for growth and scale. Sure, I'll, I'll jump in. I think I think for us the the biggest challenge is just the difficulty of what we're doing. We have a very long term view, um, and balancing that long term view of this is how we think the world will exist in the future and why we're we're building what we're building with what exists right now. And some of those points you make bets. So you make bets that your prediction will be right. Um, you won't always be right. So you've got to kind of balance, okay, do I build something right now which solves a problem but it's much smaller than what we think will be the the kind of solution in the future? Or do I just go straight for that end goal? And I think that that balance is really hard for projects to achieve. And I think Deepin's really, really felt that. The last kind of wave of deep in projects went through this where you talk about use cases and demand side and the demand side that you might actually want to address might not exist yet. And if you only build for that demand side, you're going to struggle because you'll kind of bootstrap a supply, you'll, you'll get all of the th kind of things in place, but people just don't realize what they can do yet. Uh, and I think you've got to somehow address the current problems, but also be building for the future. And, very, very tricky balance to achieve. I don't think there's a kind of solution in like capital or people or kind of amount of hardware on the network or anything like that. I think it's just the kind of business decisions and the incentives you have within your organization, which is a, a difficult thing to build. Anybody else? Um, all right, let's, let's think about something else. This is deep in day. We're talking about AI, but I wanted one more, one more question on AI and then I'm gonna take it, zoom it out into deep in even more. But with regard to AI, anything out, and I, this is a bit of a leading question, but you know, we've seen um, the challenges that some of these centralized models have, the biases in, inherent in them. And I guess I'm just curious on any of your guys' perspective on AI and deepen and centralization and how, you know, we've, we've touched this a little bit, but how you think um, where you think the future goes. And, you know, you mentioned, Ben, it's smaller models, specific models, maybe, but there's another world where Google and Microsoft just dominate, regulate, and those models are. So kind of curious, your guys' perspectives on, um, on what type of models and what kind of AI future we see over the next, you know, in the next kind of, this world moves fast, but let's just say the next three years from now. So I, I think I'll go a little bit more technical in this. I think today's LLMs are not going to exist in four to five years' time because in general, they are auto-regressive and you can't control the output of the LLMs itself. So probably it needs to be a reinvention of the architecture of the models. And if there is such a thing, then it will be smaller models. Uh, and it's more specific to um, each data economy, each uh, region, because every region has its own uh, consumer patterns. So the partition model um, that was mentioned, I think it will, it will work more. It will be smaller models and decentralized models. And would you talk about the autoregression a little bit more? Uh, generally, so it, um, I think, so generally like when you put something into the RM, you're not sure what's going to, act, uh, the output of it, you're not, going, you're not sure what's going to come out. So when it hallucinates, it gives like a random output, you can't control that and it, gives, it gets to the end consumer. What GPT does is that it does, uh, it, do, it does a filter to ensure that some of these 
content doesn't get out to the public. Like if I ask um, so, um, some like some things that are uh, taboo or like um, I ask like how to build a bomb or something, they will not output this to me. But in general, the LM knows because it has been trained on a generic data set uh, for that. So I think it's kind of hard to control these LM models. So your point is they won't exist because they'll be regulated or because people, I've heard other arguments that people using them actually make them dumber as well? Uh, yes, I think generally um, if you do the retraining of the model correctly, it, it's not going to be get dumber, but you'll get smarter and or more, more accustomed to what people want. Um, I, I think my, my point is that um, for all LRMs, you, you probably need to build like a rule-based engine to ensure that, or a filter to ensure that some outputs don't get out. Um, so, uh, but the big data there is still going to be existing. Uh, but that's, that's a challenge for decentralized ones because ex they will certainly exist, right? And yep. they will not be filtered. Yes, that will be a challenge, yeah. So probably there needs to be a blanket governance over all of these things. Not holding my breath for that. <laughs> yeah, that's the hard part. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I'm not really kind of a, a machine learning engineer uh, in any sense. So I'll, I'll kind of take maybe a different view on, on the, the kind of trajectory of the market and maybe look at uh, actual distribution of infrastructure as an indicator, right? Uh, so if you look at... Uh, the development of high-performance computing-capable data centers uh, across the world, those that are capable of dealing with and handling high-performance uh, AI chips, they're popping up everywhere, right? If you look at the distribution of uh, H100 GPUs, again, in, in overseas markets, uh, they're, they're popping up everywhere. Uh, and those are resources that are really kind of out of the reach to a certain degree of, of these large uh, language models that dominate the market today. So uh, unless the expectation is that those uh, pieces of equipment remain uh, entirely idle uh, over the next kind of three to five years, definitely there's this assumption that uh, a certain amount of training will be occurring uh, on uh, equipment and infrastructure that is uh, separate to that of the infrastructure that we see kind of out there deployed today. Yeah, again, I, I get, I'll, I'll start this by saying I'm also not a machine learning engineer, but I think, um, you know, what, one of the things like um, that we see with, with the ultra low latency data delivery um, is, is in one simple use case, it's, it's the use case of a circuit breaker. Right, so just flip a switch. You see something that you are, you know, um, or you see something that machine learning algorithm is not happy with, then the 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 flip the switch gets flipped. And and in this specific use case, I think that you know this is what we see. We we focus a lot on the composability of data between multiple streams, right? So looking at multiple different blockchains, bringing the, the that data together, uh, and then having you know sort of that ultra low latency that you can act on. And we see that people leave kind of um, half finished um, builds. Right, builds that they thought, okay, I got to this point and, and this is quite interesting and I'm going to just leave this and let other people build with this. So when it comes to actually these, these um, sort of uh, models, we, we see that um, you know, the, these, these very specific task-specific compositions um, that actually can, can, like Lego cubes, build on top of each other to, to achieve different outcomes um, that might be specific just to the Philippines, for example, right? Um, or might be specific just to a certain situation um, between between certain chains that somebody's looking for, um, we completely see that as the future. Not because we, like, again, not machine learning expert, but because we can see that's how people are building on, on our technology. And, uh, and that's what, you know, we can see as a trend right now. I, I think I'd strongly agree with that. I think that's the, the progression we're going to see. Um, and I think I'd, I'd probably disagree with some of the, the points earlier. I think um, the, in my opinion, we're in the next, like, revolution of technology right now and it's the machine intelligence revolution the last one was the like connectivity revolution of the internet where we scaled up all of the technology that we had and allowed it to communicate but it was very very deterministic and imperative and that's what most people are used to they're most they're used to interacting with technology in this way where i know exactly what it's going to do and i know exactly how it works i think we're moving actually forwards but also backwards with machine learning where we're moving to a probabilistic world we exist in a probable 
globalistic world anyway. As humans, we're used to it. We had to kind of change our mindset to interact with technology to be more imperative. And we're trying to in enforce that imperative nature on top of models. And I think that's going to be a really weird thing that we tried to do for a while, but realistically, we'll eventually embrace this probabilistic world where actually interacting with technology isn't interacting with imperative code anymore. It's interacting with essentially another person. So if I want to understand what's going on in this room, for example, I would use a machine learning model to process an image that's uh, of, of everything in here, and it would like pick out certain points and things like that in the traditional world. I'd say there's an exact color here, and I know what it is. But actually, the new models will be able to pick out information in a much more probabilistic way. They'll be able to have inferences about this room that a person might have, and some of them might be wrong. And I think we're going to get used to that and uh, eventually we'll move to this world where we don't actually need those kind of imperative checks on top of model outputs that we think we need right now. And I think Gemini, the, the Google model that we've all probably seen where they've put kind of inference side checks in to say that actually this should reflect the world in a certain way and it's not acceptable for it to kind of make these inferences, that will start to move away because we accept that models are actually closer to people than they are to code. And I think that's going to be a really weird thing for the world to accept. Listen, that, that's very, we could have a whole discussion just on that. Um, and, and the thing I'd say is that we live in a probabilistic world, but humans don't like that. And that's actually the problem, is that we don't like that. That You could look at religion, you could look at all kinds of constructs we've come up to actually avoid any uncertainty, because we don't like uncertainty. And so I think that's why we're seeing this Gemini built the way it is to actually try to... Um, teach and give an answer that a certain group of people want to have as a definitive answer. And so moving away from that, I think, is going to be complicated. Um, but, but necessary and open sources, I think, is, is, is the path there. Let's, we're running out of time. I want to have one, one other question, though, for everybody here. Um, besides what you're working on, what else do you find out there in the deep in space that you think is interesting, exciting, or important? Last question. I'm, I'm happy to jump in. Um, we, the way we view what we're working on is very, very thin. So we only connect up compute. It's very hard, so we don't want to do anything else. Uh, we want to focus on verifying compute and making that work really well. But the vision of the future we have requires lots of other things. So some of the things that I find exciting are um, the data problem. So if, you, if you've got a network where you can access any uh, GPU, TPU, CPU, whatever it is in the world, and you can run a model on it, how are you finding the data to run alongside that? And what we'd love to see is a network that could sit alongside Jensen and allows access to the local data on the device that is performing the compute. So anyone that's kind of building that, there's been lots of attempts to do that in the past. Um, we've got certain kind of views of how it should work, but that's one of the things that I find incredibly exciting. Because I think, like you mentioned before, with federated learning, that's going to be the future of how we build these models. It's going to be highly, highly federated models training over millions of devices using local data. But then in order to do that, you need privacy preserving machine learning techniques as well. Um, these are all really nascent things, but really exciting. And I think they all need to happen kind of at the same time for us to get the true kind of vision of the future. One of the other things is, is the expert knowledge in model design, some way of incentivizing people to bring their own models and say, hey, I've designed a slightly better federated piece of model. I'm going to deploy it here, but I want to be rewarded for that. And then I think what we see in the decentralization space is we can have incentive mechanisms over all of that. Um, and you can apply them in very similar ways with like deep challenges for each of them. So people who are building that kind of stuff as well, I think, uh, are doing some really good work, and it's, it, it's pretty exciting. Yeah, um, so I mentioned them before, but I think uh, autonomous economic agents are really cool. Um, I think that uh, um, empowering um, bits of code um, to be fully, you know, fully self-executing um, is 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 really part of the future. And um, but I also think that that right now, um, if you look at the cost um, of uh, doing a lot of this processing, a lot of it gets bundled up into storage. And I think what we see is that a lot of um, you know a lot of the storage providers, like everybody's saving their own data, everybody's indexing their own data and it's 60 to 70 percent of the cost of most of the models right so getting to this point where people really kind of accept the trustlessness of centralized storage solutions for um, you know some of the common data that we all rely on um, it, it will be a huge breakthrough and it will also free up a lot of resources to uh, um, to making them you know to to use for other purposes so we'd love to see some of that I'll use two mics um, 
So I think on, on my side, we, we're really interested in the gaming side as well, right? Um, and Deepin has this you know, fantastic kind of use case for, for gaming. If you take a look at kind of the gaming ecosystem as a whole, there's like 3.3 billion gamers out there. Uh, 2.8 billion of them are gaming on low-end devices, right? And as we all know, the cost of GPUs are, are higher than they kind of ever have been before. So this like the price of participation is increasingly rising, yet uh, the proliferation of gaming as kind of a hobby and access to it through kind of low-end uh, forms of technology is, is kind of improving year on year. So you have this kind of situation where, uh, as a gaming industry, you're asking yourself, uh, how do I unlock access for this 2.8 billion gamers to kind of high-end content that's being produced in these big AAA studios that you know uh, kind of are, are, are what uh, you and I would consider mainstream gaming. So I think Deepin has this really cool uh, potential to uh, essentially increase the scalability of, of technology like cloud gaming, right? Whereby you can disconnect the user's requirement to have and own. Uh, types of hardware necessary to play uh, specific games. Uh, and you can kind of take that solution and scale it in a way that's far more realistic than, you know, for example, uh, raising the GDP of a region so everyone can afford an iPhone 15 or, or, or a, um, you know, a 3090. So I think uh, Deepin will play a really interesting role in, uh, in gaming as well moving forward. Yeah, for my side, I'm excited about the convergence of Deepin, uh, D-Science, and uh, ZKs. I think medical data is something that's really, uh, they need the data to recite uh, where it is. The data sovereignty data is really uh, important there. So with the amount of um, data available, like uh, we can, I hope that one day we can sell our own personal data and not like Medical Institute uh, to monetize it and somehow they can create new vaccines or new medical inventions that will benefit us. So I think I'd love to see the convergence of both the science dependent ZKs soon. Um, that's great, but I, I'm, I'm sorry to report that you all got that wrong. The right answer is Fluence. Yeah. Our cloudless computing <laughs> platform is obviously the most interesting project besides what you guys are on. So that was an easy one. You missed it. Um, but with that, I want to thank our panel. Let's give them a round of applause and on to, on to the next. <laughs>